Uh, right, a very warm welcome to this uh, re-recording of the keynote speech um, that Laura Guthrie made for the Nottingham presentation of the Open Road Conference. Um, just a, a quick audio description of me. I'm a white woman in my late 40s with fair uh, curly hair with a streak of grey and I'm wearing glasses. Um, so the Open Road Conference uh, was a national programme produced by the New Carnival Company on the Isle of Wight uh, with three conferences that were delivered in uh, 2022. The Nottingham Conference was um, produced by City Arts and MCAN, which is the East Midlands Caribbean Carnival Arts Network. And we were delighted to have welcomed Laura to be our keynote speech and talk about her experience with um, Carnival and supporting uh, her groups and her programs to be part of that and her overall approach to inclusive practice, inclusive good practice, I should add. So thank you, Laura. Thank you for taking time to, to record this for the, for the archive. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for asking me. Um, it does feel quite strange to do something that you presented a while ago, but I think it's it's really nice that it's being recorded. So thank you very much. So I'm Laura Guthrie. I'm a white woman with um, blondish, curly, short, curly hair. I wear brown, round glasses. Um, and today I'm wearing a pale pink uh, blouse. Um, and I'm sat in the City Arts offices today. So a fairly white background for me today. So um, I'm going to just do the same presentation that I did at the conference, but I've changed it slightly because this is a recording. So things are slightly different when they're live to when they're recorded. So I started out with explaining a bit about myself and my background and my work um, in the, both carnival and the arts and theatre mainly. I'm not a carnival artist um, or an expert on carnival, but I have enjoyed attending um, as an audience member. And I've also been really fortunate to attend and take part in carnivals alongside other disabled artists. Um, and also in my 14 years career as an arts development officer in local authority, um, I also set up and ran a programme of outdoor public small festivals that often included a very carnival feel with large processional puppets and samba bands and lantern processions. So um, although I'm not an expert, I hope what I have to say is, is useful for, for you all. So I'm going to share a, uh, the presentation with you. So I'll just do the screen share. So let's hope the technology works for us on this. Here we go. Could you give me the thumbs up, Alison, if that's working? Great. OK, so um, I thought I would start by just explaining a little bit about myself. Um, let me see if I can uh, change the slide. Oh, I'm not sure if I can. Um, doesn't seem to be letting me change the slide. So what I'm going to do is just stop sharing and see if I can make sure that maybe there's another way of doing it. Um, you might want to pause the recording, Alison, while I work this out. Okay. Right, thank you for your patience. We've got our, our technical uh, brain back on, so I'll hand back to Laura. Thanks, Laura. Thank you very much, Alison. So, as I was saying, um, I'm a theatre maker, director, facilitator, trainer and a consultant. And um, I thought I would start by explaining kind of my road to here, really. Um, I'm guessing, like me, lots of you wear lots of hats. Um, to mostly I wear about three or four at once, but thankfully they are all based around the arts and theatre and community engagement or participation. A common thread throughout my work is my own identity as a disabled person. Despite the fact that I've lived in this same body since birth, I didn't arrive at this self-definition until I had it pointed out to me aged about 25. I was invited to sit on the Arts and Disability Monitoring Committee at Arts Council in London. Um, and at the time, I was working for an organisation called Carousel, who are based in Brighton. They're a combined arts company working with learning disabled adults. And I was working as a facilitator and dancer. 
I received the letter inviting me to join the committee and I was puzzled as to why me. I was a very junior member of staff um, and I felt a lot less qualified than my colleagues. So I asked a colleague um, why I'd received this invitation and they said, and I quote, because you're a disabled person. And this was honestly the first time that anyone had said that to me. But once I became awakened to the world of disability arts in the early 90s, I began to understand why certain paths had not been available to me. Where that um, nagging feeling of responsibility and shame was actually from. And it came from when people stared, when they made comments and asked questions and where I was denied access to certain activities. That's when I'd been feeling shameful of myself and responsible for making those people feel okay about whether they had offended or upset me. I learned that there was a strong and proud community of disabled artists who knew what it was like and knew how I felt and more importantly knew what needed to change. But much has changed since then, that was a long time ago, but it's still not enough. And we'll come back to this later on, I'm sure. So at the moment, my current hat is that I work for Grey Eye Theatre Company. It's a national award-winning disabled-led company now celebrating its 40th year. And we specialise in creating disabled-led work with embedded access as part of each production. A description of this slide, we have the Grey Eye logo in white with black and red writing. Grey Eye is a force for change in world-class theatre, boldly placing deaf and disabled actors centre stage and challenging preconceptions. At Grey Eye, I work as the artist development manager and I run our artist development programme beyond. And this slide shows the logo, which is a white background with a yellow arrow with Grey Eye written in black and the word beyond in pink across the arrow. It's a two year programme run in partnership with um, venues across the northeast, the north and the northwest and the East Midlands. Um, the venues include Hull Truck Theatre, uh, Live Theatre, Northern Stage, Cast in Doncaster, Bolton, uh, uh, the Octagon, sorry, in Bolton, Shakespeare North, the newly opened theatre in Prescott, and Nottingham Playhouse and the Curve Theatre in Leicester. We have 48 deaf, disabled and neurodivergent artists on the programme and they all receive a bespoke service um, supporting them with micro bursaries, rehearsal space, mentoring, um, support with funding applications and also in raising their profile and their work with both the beyond venues and the wider industry. My other hat is uh, with Ramps on the Moon. Um, this uh, slide shows you two images, um, uh, three images, sorry, the um, red circle logo of Ramps on the Moon. Um, the writing is in white on a, uh, a red background, sorry, with the names of the partner venues, um, well, the cities in Birmingham, Leeds, Nottingham, London, Sheffield and Ipswich. Um, underneath two images of um, two of the productions, one on the left is the production of Tommy, where we see a singer in a smart navy costume with a guitar and dancers either side. And on the other side, we have a picture of the production, The Government Inspector, where we see an ensemble of deaf and disabled actors in a bunch looking um, out of camera and shocked with some of them have their hands on their mouths and they were wearing early 20th century costumes. And the strap line for um, Ramps on the Moon is enriching stories by normalising the presence of deaf and disabled people on and off stage. 
I worked as an agent for change at Nottingham Playhouse for Ramps on the Moon, and now I work freelance as a scouting agent. I'm really proud of how Ramps has, has brought deaf and disabled artists to the fore, creating large scale national touring shows um, with predominantly deaf and disabled cast members, but also offering training opportunities as part of the wider creative team for deaf, disabled and neurodivergent artists. This initiative and Grey Eyes work have been instrumental in raising the bar in both casting and embedding access with main stage productions. And we'll go back to the work of Grey Eye and that embedded access a little bit later on in the presentation. My third hat is with Meander Theatre. Um, and that's the hat that I'm wearing today because it's with Meander that I've done most of the carnival and festival based work. Um, this slide shows the Meander logo at the top, Meander Theatre Arts, creating opportunities within theatre arts practice for young people and adults with learning difficulties over an image of a performer holding a white feather. We have two, three other images. Um, we have um, a performer in a green hoodie in midair in rehearsal rooms, a learning disabled man working at a lighting desk and four performers in a pink environment in a circle with their backs to each other, stretching away to create a dynamic freeze. I'm the co-director and co-founder of Meander, and we're based in Nottingham. We work alongside learning disabled and autistic adults and young people. And our main focus is to increase opportunities for work by this community and to be given a professional platform to do that. Jane Hart and myself set up Meander in 2011, but it wasn't our first theatre company, but I'll talk more about that later. Meander is guided by a steering group of 11 learning disabled um, and autistic adults, and we are currently working with that group to, uh, to create an incorporated company. These are some pictures that I've got of the work of Meander. Um, their production pictures. On the left is a production that was called Dreams and Aspirations, and it's a group of dancers stood with their arms outstretched in different directions, dressed in pale blue t-shirts around a performer sat on a duvet. Uh, the picture on the right is a male white performer with black top and trousers, dancing with a white plastic bag held high in the air, with a strong light growing, uh, glowing from it. And that's from our production, Thrown Away, which we took to the Nottingham Puppet Festival a few years ago. Um, we run um, regular sessions with Meander at Nottingham Playhouse. Um, we have a company there called Playhouse Platform. And prior to that, we ran those regular sessions at Lakeside Art Centre in Nottingham, where the company was called Lake Enders. We create one show a year annually, mostly, um, obviously through the pandemic, that was slightly different. We did a lot of work online. And a few years ago, um, we were able to join in the Nottingham Puppet Festival. This slide shows the Playhouse platform performers um, dressed as farmers in outdoor gear in the centre of Nottingham with grey eyes, enormous processional puppets, the Iron Man. Um, which came to visit Nottingham uh, Market Square. And these performers um, created the ensemble for this particular production of the Iron Man, an incredible experience for, for the performers. And some further uh, images on the next slide of Meander's work. Um, we have a montage of three pictures of the group. We have in the top left hand corner, um, a black learning disabled man and a white woman clapping and smiling. The bottom left two people, um, a learning disabled white woman in mid conversation with another person on Zoom. Through the pandemic, we did a lot of hybrid working. Um, there's a white woman holding a laptop with a face mask on. And on the left of the screen is a single black and white picture of three performers in a tight huddle, looking through their hands shaped like circles at each other. In 2019, um, we made a show called Me, Nick and Joe with a cast of three performers. In this image, you can see on the left the flyer for the show, which is uh, yellow with black writing. It has two photo booth strips. One is of three women posing separately in a booth, 
and the writing says how three women make, break and mend a friendship. On the left is a production photo of Meenik and Joe with three performers dressed in glittery party outfits, cheering each other with blue cans of cocktails. This piece focused on how this group of disabled women are navigating their friendship through a lot of changing life experiences. And over the lockdown, we continued with both weekly sessions and the Meenik and Joe project. This was online um, through Zoom mostly. Um, and the Meenik and Joe cast did a lot of skill development and also produced an audio version of the show, um, of the stage show. So we kept busy throughout the whole of the pandemic. So that's kind of the background of the work that I've done. My first taste of carnival as I mentioned earlier on, um, was much earlier than uh, Meander. Um, it was with Jane and mine's very first company. We left university both having completed a theatre design degree and we set up Fat Cat Theatre. We ran this for three years and it focused mainly on puppetry and immersive theatre experiences for disabled young people and adults. And at Fat Cat, we had taken part in the Nottingham Riverside Festival, and this was back in 1990. Um, and what you're seeing here on the screen is a Nottingham Evening Post article um, that shows um, it's a very grainy old cutting from, a, um, from the newspaper. It's a line of people using wheelchairs with large animal puppets being carried in the line by ambulant people. There's a musician at the front of the line with a drum and we're all walking next to the river on a tarmac path. The words, um, I'm not sure, I can't read the words on my screen, so apologies, I can't, I can't uh, audio describe what it says, but it describes the fact that there's a group of people um, in the Riverside Festival. For the participants, this was an incredibly rare experience of taking part in something so public alongside the community in which they lived. Remember, this was back in 1990. It was a long time ago. Um, but it was, at the time, I remember, a really important experience, both for Fat Cat, but also for the participants that took part. An important element of that experience was the support that we got from the staff at the centres where the participants were either living or attending on a daily basis. Those staff members willingness to put in additional hours and to ensure that the participants got the most from the whole experience, both the making sessions because these puppets you see were made as part of the sessions with the, those participants, and but also being able to be in the parade itself. Um, this slide is another grainy old photograph. This was pre-digital photographs. Um, it looks a bit like I've created some sort of fancy Instagram filter, but I really haven't. This is an old photograph. And again, you can see the line of people um, using wheelchairs and, and having large puppets carried alongside the riverbank. And it's a very, very sunny day. This was a very different experience to our latest experience that we had in Carnival with the flamingos. So Meander took part in the Nottingham 2019 festival. And how did this happen? Well, we were asked by Alison Denholm from City Arts if any of the Meander members would like to take part. Alison knew the group from our involvement in the puppet festival that I mentioned earlier on with the Iron Man and also the Thrown Away show that we'd performed at that festival. So we, she knew that we worked with an enthusiastic performance group and that, were puppet, and that puppets were part of our work. Um, in this slide, you can see two pictures and the text says, Meander takes part in Nottingham Carnival. The picture on the left is a white man wearing a Star Trek t-shirt and glasses and a black bowler hat with green antennae sticking out at different angles with tassels as well hanging off them. He has a small smile. The top picture is a group of six people sat at a table, all with brushes in their hands, creating round tissue paper circles and all the women in the shot 
um, are wearing, oh, sorry, off in the shop, there's one woman, they're all women, but one woman is wearing the same bowler hat um, with green antennae. And it's a very industrious atmosphere. So the first step was to give people autonomy over whether or not they took part. And this we approached by providing accessible information, such as easy read letters for people to take away and ponder on, maybe talk to other people in their house or their support network to decide whether they wanted to take part. Alison also attended a session in the late spring so that the group could meet her and ask their own questions and they could gauge for themselves how friendly and supportive Alison uh, and her team would be. And as I said, the group took, had taken part in the puppet festival um, the year before. So they were familiar with Alison and some of the new city arts and the premises as well. From this meeting, um, a group of six people volunteered to take part. Not all were from the Playhouse platform group, which was lovely. There were some new people that Meander had never met before either. Not all of the participants were able to attend each of the six weekly sessions, but that was okay because the format didn't require consistency. And that was quite important in terms of making it accessible because some of the group had work commitments during the week. And also it was summer project. So quite a few people were on holiday. So as I say, we had regular sessions that we ran on a weekly basis and to help maintain a routine, which for some of the participants is key to creating a safe and accessible environment. We held the sessions on the same day and time that we usually held the Meander Wednesday afternoon uh, sessions. Um, we had taken a break from our weekly drama sessions on a Wednesday, so that made this possible. In this picture, in this slide, sorry, there are uh, two pictures. Um, the wording says regular sessions, and you can see in the pictures a group of women around a craft table trying on hats with green feathers and large pink petals and lots and lots of smiling faces. The sessions were led by Alison and Meander found the additional support team, which was a support worker or creative enabler. And Jane and I also attended the sessions. Jane attended more as I was working on another project at the time and also slipped away on holiday at one point. Alison introduced the process in stages, starting with an overview of the planned outcome. The giant flamingos, which you'll see in photos later, but were there on the open day conference live in person. Um, and then each week, the participants made their own visual representations of the theme, leading to them creating elements of the flamingos and the costumes as well. They also had a practice at driving scooters at City Arts. It was a small group, but incredibly productive, relaxed and honestly joyful. These are the flamingos that were created. Um, you've got two pictures here on the slide of the day of the carnival. The picture on the left, you have one man and one woman in the carnival parade. Um, they're traveling under a canopy of trees and both sat on mobility scooters that are encased in a pink body with a large neck of pink and purple discs. And they've got a large flamingo head on top. They're all made of a spongy material and both the man and the woman driving the scooters are wearing hats with pink shapes on and are smiling broadly. The second picture is the same scene but now all three of the participants, um, so two white men and one white woman, are in shot. Um, there are other carnival troops behind. Um, three of the group were able to attend the actual carnival, the three people that you can see here in the uh, images. Um, and they drove the flamingos on the motorized scooters. This was a first for them. They'd had a practice on the scooters at City Arts. And as I mentioned, not all were able to do it. So for two of the group, this really was their first go on the scooters. The participants were support supported by Jane Hart and an access support worker, and of course, all of the City Arts and the Carnival team as well. But you can guess that they had an absolute complete ball. 
there was a slight issue with driving skills, resulting in a slight deep to hook from the path at one point, but everyone was fine. To have spent six weeks contributing to the creation of the Flamingos, then to be able to take part in this significant cultural celebration in their own hometown was affirmation for these participants. Affirmation that they were really accepted and part of the community. I was gutted to miss it. But talking to the participants even a few weeks later, the enthusiasm and joy with which they talked about the day really was something else. I asked Ben and Julie a week before I did the presentation what they remembered from the project and this is what they told me. I remember we were with Alison from City Arts. We were in the studio making flamingo hats, practicing driving the scooters. My favourite thing was working with Alison. She was a nice lady and she had come to watch us perform since. I made a flamingo puppet and a dream catcher, and I enjoyed meeting new people. About the carnival, this participant said, it was a lovely day. I felt happy. Margaret and my family came and were happy and proud. I would be in a carnival again. It gives you confidence in your ability to do things like drive the scooter. And in winter, we went to Snenton Market and did another one with our own puppets at night. So for this participant, the experience with the flamingos really encouraged them to volunteer again for a further procession and this time at night. And this is someone who rarely attends evening trips that we at Meander set up. We go and see shows, theatre shows mostly in the evenings and sometimes matinees. But for this person, going out at night independently is not a regular or comfortable experience. So the fact that being part of the Flamingos, giving them the confidence to then go and volunteer and be part of another processional puppet event is quite extraordinary. The other participant that I spoke to told me, it made me feel good. I liked doing it. I liked going to different to a different place and traveling along the parade, parade. Sorry, I liked people watching, and I was happy because my mum was watching and she was proud. The workshops I like making stuff. I like making the animal. I don't get much chance to make things. I thought Alison and City Arts were good. It was important I did fun stuff. Going on the vehicles, I would do it again but different, like cartoons or Thundercats costumes on the scooters or lions. It made me more confident. I enjoyed it because there were other people I knew there. A common theme is Alison. And not surprising, but important to note, the attitude and atmosphere created by Alison and her team was a key part of making the experience feel safe and accessible. It seems obvious, but it really is possible not to create that atmosphere. Another recurring element is the confidence built up, people feeling proud and enjoying being watched by others. So what can we do to ensure we create accessible carnival events that more deaf, disabled, learning disabled and neurodivergent people can take part in both as take part in as audiences and as makers? My main area of experience is in theatre and community events, not carnival, as I said earlier. But I believe there's a common approach that all of us can use to support our planning and delivery of accessible public events. And that approach is the social model. Um, this is very rare for me to do any sort of talk or training without mentioning the first so uh, without mentioning social model in the first five minutes. So this is quite unique. Um, but the social model on this new slide um, states that uh, the social model def uh, defines disability as a social construct. And the picture you can see below is the front cover of the book Winnie the Witch by Corky Paul and Valerie Thomas. Um, it's an illustration of a witch trip, tripping over a black cat. The witch has a blue hat with yellow stars, a blue dress and red and yellow tights. So the social model, it's commonly adopted by disability arts practitioners and it's 
it's it's not the only approach to access or disability and it doesn't necessarily fit every disabled person's ambition but it's used often to replace the previously outdated medical model so what is social model social model defines disability as a social construct it was created by disabled people in the sort of late 70s, early 80s, when there was at that time quite an increase in disabled activism. And it was, it was kind of created partly in defiance of the then and still used today medical model. There's a docudrama film that's available on BBC iPlayer written by Jack Thorne and Genevieve Barr. It's called Then Barbara Met Allen. And it chronicles the work and influence of, of, um, of the Disability Action Network, as it was called then. Um, it's quite an interesting film and I'd really recommend watching it. Um, so going back to the social model, the social model, as I've said, is, is considered to be a construct, a social construct, and it places disabling behaviour within society and the environment um, in which people live and work. Um, that's both in terms of people's attitudes as well as the physical environment, as opposed to placing disability with an individual and focusing on an individual's impairment or diagnosis. So in short, it sees the barriers that uh, disable people coming from external sources. So I'm not a disabled person because I have one arm. I'm disabled by the attitudes and assumptions that people make about me and some of the environmental constructs that make some physical tasks difficult because most things are set up for people to have two arms or two hands. Um, in another situation, a person that uses a wheelchair isn't um, disabled by their impairment or diagnosis, but by the lack of ramped or level access buildings. A person who is deaf and uses BSL sign language is British Sign Language is not disabled because they're deaf, but be disabled because there are not BSL interpreters available to them. And in particular, not available at national televised emergency statements, for example. Um, there are various different websites and organisations that give you quite a lot of information around the social model. Um, Shape, on this slide, we've got the logos of Shape Arts, Inclusion London, and the National Disability Arts Collection and Archive, NDACAF, as well as Unlimited. So Shape Arts and Unlimited are arts organisations and that support uh, disabled artists. And Inclusion London is more of a uh, organization that supports disabled people as a whole. Um, all of those you can find online quite easily. And all of them, some of them, um, NDACA have a very interesting animation that gives you a really good background in social model as does Unlimited's website as well. Um, so um, just going on to just briefly the um, differences between the social model and medical model. So as I say, the social model focuses more on the idea that um, people are disabled by society, by the environments and the attitudes that society place upon them, as opposed to the impairments. Whereas medical model tends to view it in the sense that you are disabled by your impairment or diagnosis. And if we focus on curing you or medicalizing you, that disability will go away. Um, the next slide has a very basic two columns that show the kind of summary of the difference between the two models. Um, on the left, we have the medical model and on the right, the social model. So when we think about the medical model and the individual. The medical model will focus on the individual as the issue, whereas the social model will focus on the environment.
To find out more about a person, the medical model might ask, what is wrong with you? Whereas the social model might ask, what are the obstacles or the barriers that you face? When um, asking for personal information, um, medical model might ask for something like, what medication do you take? Whereas the social model might ask for practical information. For example, do you need um, a private space or breaks to support you taking any medication during this event? So those are kind of, they're very sparse, but they're kind of the very basic differences between the two models. So what can we learn from um, accessible theatre approaches? First of all, I think there has to be clarity when approaching access for any event, for both the audience and the artists or creatives that you want to reach or you want to work with. And the approach will be the same, but what is in place might differ. So the approach between um, a, a theatre-based event and a carnival outdoor event is probably going to be the same, but there might just be slightly different offers. For audiences, there are um, various different things that you can offer in terms of access and, and many resources that are commonly offered. This slide is looking at embedding access into Carnival and you have three standard logos on this slide. All three are white with um, black logos, uh, white backgrounds with black logos. Um, the sign language logo is two hands, uh, using sign language as two fingers. The audio description logo is a speech bubble with the letters AD inside. And the relaxed performance logo is a circle, a black circle with the R RP letters in a square in the center. As well as these different resources that can be offered, obviously there are also things like touch tours that you can offer. Um, a touch tour for a carnival would be amazing. You imagine a touch tour around those flamingos and the other costumes, um, quite wild. Um, dementia friendly performances are other um, resources that are often offered. Large print marketing and programs, things like sonic stories where you create a visual interpretation of how sound is throughout an experience. And you can do that for public experiences as well. If, if for example, you have a carnival event which is along um, a roadside, um, you can ensure that people know that that you're going to be doing that. And there might be loud traffic noises, for example, as part of the experience for an audience member. Um, easy read programs or show guides are really useful, um, are useful resources that are often available for accessible performances. For a carnival event, key would be the audience's experiences when in an open public crowd. So we need to think about what are the equivalent front of house resources available to ensure the event is accessible. And we'd be talking about signage, what kind of signage are you offering? What kind of accessible toilets? Still offering safe, quiet spaces for people to go to in the same way that just theater as part of a relaxed performance might offer us a quiet space. In an open public event, having a tent or a gazebo or just a cordoned off area which has got some relaxed seating, maybe bean bags or blankets or cushions, somewhere where people can go and just re-regulate themselves at some point if they feel they need to. Pre-carnival information is so important. Um, that's something that, that can be made accessible and help to make the event accessible. Buddying, BSL interpreters and support teams. So there's lots that, that as carnival we can provide that gives audiences accessible uh, experiences. The term embedded access is often used in theatre and it's there are two, two phrases you might hear, accessible performances and embedded access, and the two are different. They're both about making the experience accessible to audiences, but um, an embedded access show or performance or production means that 
it's more than just a BSL interpreter or large print programs. It means that access for deaf, disabled or neurodivergent audiences are part of the creative process itself. So you've thought creatively about how BSL interpretation can be part of that production. You've thought creatively about how captioning can be part and audio description, for example, might be part of the script. Um, Grey Eye um, does all of its work has embedded access. Um, as does Ramps on the Moon. And if you go to both of their websites, you'll find images of shows where you'll be able to see visually how embedded access um, is created and how it's part of a show. So, for example, I think I've already said that captioning in a theatre production might be aesthetically presented in a way which is akin to the design of the piece. Um, British Sign Language might be used by characters, so there might be deaf performers who are using BSL or there may be BSL interpreters who become characters within the piece as well as having deaf performers. And audio description may be within the script or it may be that the, the technical way of getting audio description to your audiences is part of the creative process. So for example, in Reasons To Be Cheerful, there is a payphone in a pub as part of the set. And the audio describer is a character that sits in the pub most of the time in the corner of the pub, enjoys a pint or two. And they are on the payphone talking to audiences who are wearing headsets who require the audio description and giving them the audio description that way. So there are ways of embedding audio description technically, creatively within a piece. And the same could be done with Carnival. Um, every show is relaxed. So all the sensory elements of the piece are designed to fit with the relaxed performance. So obviously with, with outdoor events, you're unlikely to have strobe lighting, but not necessarily not. So those kind of elements are automatically removed, but replaced with other interesting and engaging light, lighting design. Um, loud noises and so on are also limited. And where they are, that might be where you are letting audiences know through your sonic story as a, as a preempt or um, to, to the actual performance. So all the pre-show or pre-event information would include some of those uh, information about some of those elements. So what kind of sound to expect, what kind of lighting to expect, that sort of thing. Um, so that's... I'm trying to see, let's have a look at what else have we got that we wanted to say. Yes, so um, carnivals are outdoor and highly visual, um, but the atmosphere and the sounds are equally integral to the whole experience. So embedding access of is of course um, a really exciting, but it's going to logistically and creatively be different to an indoor stage production. But I still think it can be really an exciting creative process to go through. Thinking about creatives, um, when Alison created the, um, I'm just going to go back to that slide for a moment. When Alison created the scooter cop costumes for the flamingos, she was already embedding access creatively. She was making the actual taking part in a carnival accessible for a wheelchair user in a creative way. Um, either for a wheelchair user, but also for people for whom long distance walking is not accessible or walking in crowds or being in crowds is not accessible. And it's a great example of embedded access. Going back to that grainy photograph that I showed you from 1990, that was not embedded access. What we had there were disabled people using wheelchairs who were being pushed along the embankment with non-disabled people carrying the puppets that they had made. Now, back in 1990, that was still a great experience. But now, now what Alison has done made it possible for people to be fully 
embedded and for the access to that experience to be a fully embedded one. It's part of the creative process. What we did back then, we did with full honesty and genuineness. Genuineness? I don't know if that's even a word. But now, looking back, I think, oh, no, that's not social model. I wouldn't do it like that again. OK, so for our Flamingo participants, um, there needed to be other changes to make the whole event accessible. So this centred mainly around preparation for the event. The build up through the weekly sessions provided much of this, plus the support workers that attended both the sessions and the day itself. Logistically, ensuring people's transport was in place to get to and from the event, that was incredibly important. And we didn't get it all right. Factoring in the time it might take for getting through crowds on foot and maintaining a steady speed throughout the carnival parade as well was something we'd not thought through. For example, how long a trip to the toilet might take, and then meaning that someone's got to catch up with the parade. Um, access riders are becoming more commonplace. Um, there's documents that you can find online. If you, if you put into an internet search um, access riders, you'll find lots of examples. Uh, Unlimited website has examples as well. Um, and these are documents that are created by artists or creatives for a company that they're going to be working for. And they do that prior to the start of a project. It gives autonomy to the artists over how and when they express their access requirements. And it gives the organization employing them a clear picture of what they need to put into place for the creative of the artist to do their best work. So whether we're creating opportunities for people to take part in, lead, or be an, an audience member of carnivals, there are rich and varied ways of achieving access for deaf, disabled, and neurodivergent people. Personally, I can't wait to be involved in another carnival. I absolutely loved it. The creative challenges and the atmosphere of the end result is just magnificent. I hope this has been interesting and useful for you. Um, I wanted to dedicate this whole presentation to Richard, who is pictured here in this last side, slide. Um, he's in close up here. It's a headshot of Richard in full flamingo costume with a red shirt, pink flamingo feather headdress, and his honored scooter taking part in the carnival. Richard was a much loved performer and group member who brought a quiet charm to all his performances. Thank you very much. And I hope this has been useful. And back to you, Alison. Just unmute myself. Thank you very much, Laura, for, for taking us through that again. And it's, it's yeah, a really rich, um, you know, set of questions and responses that you've that you've mapped out, and lots to lots to learn for all of us, but also lots of progress. And I think it is really interesting what you're saying about what you were doing in the '90s and how much it's evolved. You know how how that wasn't wrong, but actually there's more ways to be to be right and more ways to think about it. And I think that's part of what conversations like this do is keep keep thinking and responding and, and building, you know, so wonderful. And thank you for taking the time to record this for the for the um, Open Road Archive. Thank and you very see much. See you again. Thank Great. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.